Hello, my name is Ethan, and thank you for tuning in to watch this past service. While we hope this video archive is a blessing to you, I'd also like to encourage you to join us live every Sunday morning at 9, 10, 15, 11, 30, and Sunday evenings at 5 at online.timberlakechurch.com. You can expect to join a growing and loving community in which we take our faith seriously in a casual atmosphere, and in order to make you feel as comfortable as possible, no weird stuff. We offer several features for you to use during the live services, including a built-in Bible, interactive message notes, live prayer, and of course, a chat room, where myself and our online host would be glad to meet you and help you get connected to your next right step. But for now, enjoy the service, and I hope to see you this coming weekend at online.timberlakechurch.com. Good morning. Why don't you stand on your feet with us and let's worship our Father this morning. Come on, I need y'all to clap those hands like this. Hey. Y'all look good this morning. Oh. Y'all remember this one? One minute into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this vagabond. Yeah, and I try with all my might. I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road. I met a man I didn't know He told me that I was not alone He picked me up, turned me around Placed my feet on solid ground I made the master, I made the savior
you, God. We serve a mighty God, amen. He's the God who can move mountains. He's the God who can change everything in your life. Oh, you're so worthy, Jesus.
moment right now. We thank you for the chance to connect with each other and connect with you. God, we thank you for this Christmas season. And God, I thank you for all of my friends that are joining us today. And those of us that are in the room, those of us that are joining us online. God, for, for, for those of us that are excited about Christmas, for those of us that, that have been looking towards it with anticipation, that are, that are excited to be with family and friends and to celebrate you. And we're looking forward to the good things about this season. And God, for my friends, that this is maybe a little bit more of a difficult time of the year, that because of loss or because of maybe some, some pain that we're experiencing or things that, that we don't have, that this is a hard time. God, I pray for each of us that you would meet us right where we're at, that we would choose in these moments to have a posture of openness, that we would have open minds and that we would have open hearts, that we'd be open to receive exactly what you wanna do inside each one of our hearts. 
that, that we have plans, we have things that we want to accomplish, but may we yield to the plans that you have for us, the things that you want to accomplish in our hearts and in our lives, the message that you would have to speak to us today. May we quiet our minds and quiet our souls so that we can hear from you today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this Christmas season that we celebrate. Thank you for each one of my friends that are here today and what you want to speak to us if we will choose to listen. So we choose that right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake. I am so glad that you are with us today. I hope you're having a great weekend. Hello as well to all my friends who are joining us on our online campus. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Shane. I'm on the team here. Christmas is just a couple weeks away. We are so excited. Next weekend, the kids are gonna be up here singing some Christmas songs. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And then we have our Christmas Eve services. You're gonna hear a little bit more about that in a video coming up. But in the, the seat back in front of you, there is a serve at Christmas insert. If you are around, I would love it if you were able to serve at one of the services. That'd be a great thing to add to your holiday traditions. Maybe you can serve at a service and then attend one. We have lots of services. There's going to be a ton of people and we could use your help to make it a great experience for everybody. You can fill these out, drop them off at the Connect Center, or there's a QR code on here that you can scan as well. Uh, this weekend, Dave Nelson is with us. Dave's one of our teaching pastors, longtime friend at Timberlake. I know you're really going to enjoy uh, his message that he has. And then Pastor Ben will be back with us next weekend. Uh, as we receive an offering today, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. We sent out an email this week that had all of the videos from this past year uh, and all of the different ways that as a church, we were able to make an impact in our local community and our campuses and around the world. And as I was looking over all of those videos, I was just blown away uh, by your generosity. And so our theme as we head towards the end of the year is simply finish strong, that we would all finish strong in our generosity this year. Well, do me a huge favor before you find your seat. And those of you online, you can put this in the chat. Find somebody near you, introduce yourself, and then give them five reasons, no more, no less, five reasons why eggnog is the best drink ever invented. Ready, go. Christmas is one of the most important times of the year as we gather as a church to celebrate how it all started, the birth of Jesus. At Timberlake, the Christmas Eve experience is always one of the most important and impactful services of the year. And this might just be our best one yet. We'll be having 11 in-person services across four of our campuses, five online services streamed live, and two drive-in services where you can enjoy the entire celebration from the comfort of your vehicle. Our team has been planning an exciting experience for the whole family, and here are a few ways you can participate. First, pick a service to attend with your family. Next, we encourage you to invite a friend. Christmas Eve is the perfect opportunity for friends and family to experience church together in a safe and friendly environment. And finally, you can volunteer for one of our services. Between greeting, tech, my favorite worship, and the kids team, we have lots of opportunities for you to get involved. For more information and to sign up to volunteer, visit TimberlakeChurch.com slash Christmas. We're so excited for you to be a part of what God does this Christmas through Timberlake in our community. See you soon. Good morning. All right, I was expecting a little bit more energy today. A little bit of, hey, come on. The weather's halfway decent. And for those of us from Wisconsin, that weather's amazing. Hey, this is like a vacation. I want to welcome uh, those of you online. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it is uh, not just looking like Christmas today and feeling like Christmas today. For the last couple of weeks, anywhere you've gone from restaurants to stores to uh, church buildings, right? Everything has looked and felt and smelled even like Christmas. And, and it's kind of fascinating when you think about it because uh, most holidays that we celebrate, in fact, every single one I could think of is just one or two and maybe three days long, right? Think about it. New Year's Day is like 24 hours. That's what we celebrate. Um, and we've got Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We've got uh, Memorial Day, Labor Day, 4th of July. I know in the Seattle area, Seafair Weekend, three days, kind of like its own holiday. You got Halloween. And, and, you know, we celebrate these things 24, 48, maybe a little bit uh, more hours than that, but that's, that's pretty much it. 
But Christmas is different. Christmas is all month long. And during this time of year, what happens is billions of people around the planet, regardless of their religion, regardless of their faith background, regardless of their demographic, billions of people are just going to break away from their regular routines. And they're going to decorate their homes and they're going to put up lights and trees and they're going to bake stuff and they're going to go to different parties and they're going to travel far to homes with you know, other family members for the holidays. And if we were to do a poll, whether in person or we did a poll for our, our online crew um, about who uh, likes what for Christmas, it's going to differ, right? Some people are going to say, well, I like going to uh, family and other people are going to say, I just like the decor and I like singing songs. But for kids, it's pretty much going to be the same answer. What do kids like most at Christmas time? They like Christmas presents. They like gifts. That's, that's 100% what kids are into. And I, and I get it. Now, the, the issue is once you've bought them video game systems or, tele, you know, or a phone, I'll call it a telephone, telephones, right? Uh, once you buy the basics, it's like, what more can you give the kids? Well, what more do they need? And so if you're struggling this year, I've got a few ideas for you that I've come across. These are actually uh, pretty decent gifts. Uh, one of them is uh, if you maybe want them to be a chef and learn some skills, uh, Snoop Dogg came out with a cookbook. Um, and so from crook to cook with, with 50 mouth-watering recipes from the dog father himself, that's how it's advertised. Uh, this actually in the advertisement includes staples like fried bologna sandwiches, baked mac and cheese. Come on, we'll do that. Um, if they're into puzzles, you want them to be creative, use their time. We've got a jigsaw puzzle, 12,000 pieces, a lot of sky and a little bit of moon, right? How about that? Um, if they're just learning to read, we have a book that's going to screw them up. P is for pterodactyl. All right, and what I love about this book is none of the letters actually make sense, and yet that's how it's spelled, right? Like T is for tsunami. Come on, get them, get them going in this direction. C is for czar. Just fun, fun, fun. And regardless of what you end up buying your kids this Christmas um, or the money we spend on it, the truth is this entire season, we put tons of money and tons of energy and tons of our time into trying to make it magical at some level. And it's kind of appropriate because when you think about it, Christmas in general is a magical time. And in the very first Christmas, when we read the stories surrounding it, leading up to it, they had that kind of feeling to it. In fact, the announcement of Jesus' birth was made by an angel. I mean, just think, an angel in the sky, bright light to a group of shepherds. And here's what that angel, here's what we read about that event. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them. Okay, this is to a group of shepherds. They're just watching over their sheep. Angel appears and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded these shepherds. They were terrified, rightfully so, right? But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, he said. Put on a mask. No, he didn't say. He said, I will bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah of the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now that has a magical feel to it. Right? That's why even when it's recited in a Charlie Brown Christmas, there's something that just feels right about it. Now, all of us have different stories of growing up and different memories of this time of year. For me, my memories of Christmas were going to in-person services. We didn't have the option of online. And then we uh, would go to the services. We'd go to my grandparents afterwards, and we'd eat, and eat a bunch of food, and, and Santa Claus would show up. There I am in the striped shirt there, and just... Uh, mesmerized, right? Here I am, uh, there was the other one sitting on Santa's lap. There I am with a tie right after church, right? But we all have different memories of Christmas. And, and of course, like many of you, we would open the gifts and it would just feel right, feel like a fairy tale. And if we're honest, I think that's how most of us want Christmas. We want it to be a fairy tale. We want it to be magical and picture perfect. And that looks different for all of us. For, for some, picture perfect Christmas is a white Christmas, Right, I'm from Wisconsin, so we're used to snow, but I gotta tell you, on Christmas, we all want it to snow still. That's just, that's just what we want, it feels right. Uh, for you, maybe Christmas, a magical Christmas to you is that when everybody opens their gifts, there's just appreciation, right? Your kid opens their gifts and they're just wiping tears from their eyes. They're like, mom and dad, all I really wanted was you, and this is just extra. Thank you so much. It means so much, right? Maybe for you, it's uh, the, the picture of perfect Christmas. It's just peace and quiet. It's just been a chaotic year and you're just like, I just need calm. And you're used to the Santa shots getting you through the holidays, but this year you're like, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to do away with that and I'm just hoping I can have peace and calm. Maybe for you, Christmas, uh, being a fairy tale or magical feel to it is someone showing up and surprising you. 
or someone not showing up this year. Maybe that would be the picture of perfect Christmas, right? But here's what you know, because you're smart. However you envision Christmas this year in a picture perfect way, it's not going to go like that. Someone's going to open their gifts and be disappointed. I have a 22-year-old daughter. She's graduating from the University of Wisconsin and Milwaukee um, next Sunday. And um, she's worked really hard to, to get there. And she said to me a couple weeks ago, she goes, I don't know what you're planning on getting me for Christmas, but you know I've got lots of school debt and I've got a computer that I've been using all my college years. And so I'm just saying like anything would be helpful. Oh, she's going to be disappointed this year. Uh, yeah. Just, it's reality, right? My son, he said, dad, I'm 15. I'm going to be driving. He says, so I uh, just, you know, any help toward a vehicle, he's going to be disappointed. I mean, not everything's going to go picture perfect. And, and at some point in the families, you're going to have tension. There's going to be arguments. Someone's going to bring up some topic that you don't even want to discuss. And yet there it is. And, and even if everything went right, perfect with your meal preparations, like, oh my goodness, it, it, everything's here. Your daughter-in-law is going to show up and they're going to announce to the family that they're vegan and they're not going to eat it this year. You know, this is, this is how it goes. And the reality is, it's not going to be a picture-perfect Christmas, but that's okay. Because in many ways, it serves as a reminder of the very first Christmas that was anything but picture-perfect. It was really, really messy. Most people, when they think of the Christmas story, they tend to think of it as a religious story. And that makes sense because the Christmas story is in the Bible and most people view the Bible as a religious book. And so naturally it's thought of as a religious story. And I think that's what most people want. We want it to be a cute and a quaint and a nice and a tidy religious story. And the reason that most people want it to be like that is because we want religion to be predictable. I think when you get to the core of it, I think most of us want that because part of the role that religion plays in society and it always has is it makes us feel secure and safe in a world that rarely feels secure and rarely feels safe. And that's why when you break it down, every religion is pretty much the same, right? The gods of every religion, they remove themselves from hum humanity and they come up with a list of rules. And if you follow the rules, they're going to bless you. Good things are going to happen to you. And if you don't follow the rules, they're going to curse you and punish you. There's no surprises. Every religion, pretty much the same thing. But what's so fascinating about the Christmas story, if you're just looking at it from the perspective of first century Jewish society, which was when Jesus was born, it's not predictable and it's not clean and it's not sanitary. There are surprises at every turn. And so I want you to hear this today, that Christmas is not a religious story. It's just not. And today I'm going to I'm not have a whole bunch of fill in the blanks and I'm not gonna have a bunch of A, B, C, do this, do that. I just wanna walk you through the stories of that first Christmas and help us see this a little bit through first century Jewish society because when you think about it, early on in their history, the Jewish people knew that at some point a Messiah, a liberator was going to come. Someone was gonna free them from the tyranny of other empires, specifically the Roman Empire. He was the Messiah, he was, he, he, he was going to come and he was gonna lead them and be their king. Jeremiah, who was one of these prophets, he spoke these words on behalf of God. He says, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. It continues. He says, he will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. And this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. Well, that is a reference to the birth of Jesus. And so the Jewish people were accustomed to these kind of prophecies. And naturally, First century Jews just assumed that when this king, when this Messiah would enter the world, he would be surrounded by royalty and dignitaries because that is how a king is supposed to be welcomed in the world. That's how royalty is supposed to be treated. That's why when we read about kings and queens, there's always hoopla, right? There's tabloids and newspapers and people following them around with cameras. Everybody gets into it. Here's some video footage of the day that Queen Elizabeth uh, II was officially installed as the Queen of the United Kingdom, right? You see the crowds. You, you see the excitement. You see the honor that's being given to this queen who is now over the United Kingdom. 
Large crowds, pomp, circumstance, honor, big, big deal. But when Jesus entered the world, it was different. God bypassed all types of leaders, all types of dignitaries, and he invited shepherds to come and participate in the story. And we read a little bit earlier about how an angel made the announcement to these group of shepherds watching over the sheep. And immediately after making that announcement, we read this, that suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now, shepherds spent a whole lot of time in the fields, right? So they were not able to follow religious purity laws as defined by Jewish, uh, by, by Judaism, right? Because they were with sheep all the time. They had to get their hands dirty. And then on top of that, they, they couldn't keep the Sabbath law, which was a big deal because sheep need constant protection and oversight. And so shepherds were, were, were uh, uh, at the bottom rung of society. They had no influence. They're largely unnoticed by those in power. They're uneducated. They make very little money. They're isolated from people. They're lonely. They're among the lowest class of people in first century Judaism. It is not a group of people that we would ever expect to be included in the Christmas story. And then, of course, everybody assumes that when this Messiah, when this liberator, when this king arrives, that he's going to be surrounded by holy people. He's going to be surrounded by Jewish scribes and Pharisees and chief priests and people like that. But God ends up bypassing these holy people with lofty titles and invites them uh, invites individuals known as wise men from the East to be part of the story. Matthew, who is a disciple of Jesus, he, he writes about this and he says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. He says, about that time, some wise men from Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is this newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, the wise men were actually a group of astrologers known as the Magi. It's where we, where we get the word magic from. And what's interesting about this is that Jewish law strictly forbids astrology. And so God invites these individuals, these Magi, who are doing something that Jewish law strictly forbids and invites them into the story. It is not what you'd expect. It is not the way religious stories go down. On top of that, uh, these astrologers were from Persia. The official religion of the Persian Empire was Zoroastrianism, which is this belief of two gods. There's a good God and an evil God. And what's so fascinating about this is in, in Judaism, the like, most famous law of all their laws is there is one God. It's the biggest held belief. And yet God invites these wise men, these astrologers, these magi who have the wrong beliefs about God into the Christmas story. It is not what you'd expect. It is not a cute quaint, sweet, religious narrative. There are surprises at every turn. Kings, when they come into the world, you'd expect for them to be born in high-tech hospitals, right? You'd, you'd expect for them to grow up living in palaces. For example, the, the king and queen of Norway, this is where they live. That's expected. Jesus is not born in a hospital. He's not born in a palace. He doesn't grow up in a palace. He's born in a crowded barn, barn and we read this about his birth, that she... Mary gave birth to the fir her firstborn son. She wrapped him, in snugly, uh, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging for them. There was no lodging available. So Jesus is not surrounded by dignitaries. He's surrounded by animals and cows and donkeys and sheep like, and things like that. Not what you'd expect. Kings, when they come into the world, they're surrounded by wealth. They're surrounded by opulence. But this king is born to Jewish peasants. Mary and Joseph didn't register in terms of wealth or in terms of influence in society. Kings, when you lay them down, supposed to put them on nice, comfortable mattresses, right? Memory foam. That's where they're supposed to sleep. But this king, he sleeps in a first century animal feeding trough called a manger. And the reason he's put into a manger that looks very similar to this is because he's in a barn, and you can't just put him on the floor, otherwise an animal is going to step on him. Not your typical story. When we read about kings, when we read about queens, they're surrounded by massive armies. Right? Those armies are there to protect them. Those armies are there to show them honor. But this king, Jesus, and his parents, they're forced to get out of town. 
they end up fleeing persecution and the wrath of King Herod and his military force. They're immigrants in the land of Egypt. Not at all what you'd expect if you're just looking at this through the eyes of a first century Jew. It is shocking. It is not the way religious stories are supposed to read. And then Mary, she has a legally binding agreement to marry Joseph. Okay, this was very common in first century Judaism. She's engaged. They haven't consummated the marriage yet. So she's still a virgin and she gets pregnant with Jesus. This is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And if you're like, man, I cannot wrap my mind around that. I don't know what I think about that. It's hard for me to believe this. Let me tell you, you're in good company. People in the first century didn't believe this. Come on, they're thinking this is one big made. Joseph does not believe it. And we know from certain Jewish writings like the Talmud that there was a widespread rumor that Mary had actually become pregnant by a Roman soldier named Pantera. Some say she seduced him, others say she was raped, but there was this huge stigma. Now at Timberlake Church, right, we teach that, hey, th this was a supernatural virgin birth. We, we teach that, hey, despite all these crazy rumors, this stuff actually happened. But it's a scandalous story. This is getting pregnant outside of wedlock. This is about as big a deal as you can expect in first century Judaism. You're never going to live that down. That stigma follows you. It's why John, who was one of the disciples of Jesus, he writes about a time that Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders about his heavenly father and they interrupt him and say, hey, where is your father? And it's like this sarcasm. They're saying, you don't even really know who your earthly father is, but you're going to try telling us about your heavenly father? This isn't how you think God would enter the world because if anything, he's going to come in the form of thunder and lightning. There's going to be a blaze of fire with armies and chariots. This idea that an all holy, perfect, all powerful God is going to come into this world as a human being that needs to be cared for and held and protected, totally unexpected. What's expected is that he would enter into the world in a dramatic way and quickly acquire a reputation for himself, a respectable reputation. This is not a cute, quiet, sanitary religious story. If anything, it's the opposite of that. It's an irreligious story. In many ways, it's an anti-religious story. It's breaking all the rules about what predictable religions are supposed to be believing and doing. And then it just goes downhill from there. Jesus throughout his life just seems to get more and more irreligious. Everyone's assuming that this Messiah and this King is gonna be hanging out with holy people and powerful people and dignitaries. And he's going to be supporting the religious establishment and the religious establishment is going to be supporting him. Instead, Jesus butts head all the time with religious establishment. And they get upset with him because they see him going to parties and they're saying, man, at that party, there are sinners and birds of a feather, they flock together. And so Jesus must be a sinner. It's not what you'd expect for a guy born, you know, this is not what you'd expect for a guy who's the Messiah. A king, I mean, it makes sense for a guy born out of wedlock to a Roman soldier, but, but not for a liberator, not for a Messiah, not for the king of all kings. It is scandalous. Jesus is born into circumstances that look shameful and sinful. He lives in circumstances that appear sinful and shameful, and eventually he dies in circumstances that look shameful and sinful. So what I hope we can grasp this holiday season is that Christmas is all about God doing unexpected things at unexpected times through unexpected people. And because of the influence of religion, including the influence of the Christian faith, most people, when they think of God, they have a prudish understanding about God, right? They have this picture of a God who does not get his hands dirty. And that idea of God makes sense if he's the typical predictable God. But when we read the Christmas story, we learn that God is anything but predictable. He is anything but prudish. This is a story who can not only look at sinners, right? People who say they know they should do one thing but do another. People who know they shouldn't do something but then they do it anyways. They look at sinners, you and I, and pursues them. This is a God who from his birth until his death identifies fully with us in the midst of our messes. And so the Christmas story makes it clear that God identifies with us. And we need to be reminded of this over and over and over because religion constantly tells us that we need to clean up our mess first if we're gonna come to God. But Jesus, as revealed in the Christmas story, God as revealed through Jesus, God as revealed through the birth and teachings and the life and the death of Jesus 
is a God who says, I come to you first. And as that begins to hit us in a real sense and we begin to comprehend it, it really does bring comfort and joy. He's God with us in the midst of our messes. In fact, the Jewish prophet Isaiah, 700 years prior to the Christmas story, talks about the birth of Jesus. And he references Mary. He says, she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. If this was a guy who didn't like to get his hands dirty, he'd have to stay away from us because we're dirty and we're messy. But apparently what the Christmas story tells us is that God isn't afraid of dirt. He's a God who defies religious expectations. He's a God who does not fit into the normal categories of religion. He's a God who loves us. He's with us and identifies with us in the midst of our mess. And so religion may have told you that you messed up your life too much or you've messed up the lives of other people too much and so now God's angry at you and he's disappointed and he's ashamed. Maybe you were told that you're lying or that your anger or that your greed or that your pride has somehow distanced you from the love of God. Maybe you've been told that your lust issues, your infidelity, maybe even your divorce has put you outside of God's love. Maybe you were told that your drug addiction Maybe you were told that your alcohol abuse, that the abortions you've had have put you outside of God's love. Maybe you were told that just the nasty harm you've done to others has somehow put you outside of God's love. But what is revealed in the Christmas story and in the life and the death of Jesus is that there is nothing that puts you outside of God's love. He is God with us. He's God with us. And the reason this is such an important reminder today is we live in a time period where everything's so polarized and it's so easy, for myself included here, to get so upset with that person or that person if they see life differently than me. And Christmas is a reminder that Jesus came for all of us. It's a story that reveals a God whose love is infinitely greater than your infidelity and infinitely greater than your lust and infinitely greater than your issues and your anger and your alcohol abuse, the unbeliefs that you have, the doubts that you have, infinitely greater than the nasty stuff you've done to other people. And the reason we need this reminder over and over and over, and it's the reason why throughout the year at Timberlake Church and the church I pastor in Wisconsin, we talk about this over and over and over, is because we walk away from the in-person services or we shut off our computers and we're done with the service. And then what happens is We've heard about the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God and the compassion of God. And then we go out and when someone disagrees with us, we're used to this cancel culture, right? Where we cancel you or we shame you or we embarrass you or we humiliate you and we want you put down and put out of our lives and you don't deserve anything. And, and I was reminded this last week because our church that I pastor, man, we talk about grace all the time. And I, I got a call from a lady and she says, uh, Dave, um, my husband, the family's been a part of the church for years. She says, my husband uh, has COVID. He's been in the hospital now for a couple weeks. He's on a ventilator and it's not looking good. And then uh, a few days after that, it just, it's been going worse. I was on the plane flying out to Seattle and I'm getting text messages. So it, it's not looking good. But in one of our initial conversations, this woman who's heard me teach a whole lot, she said, Dave, I, I need to confess something. She says, my husband and my sons have been going to the church um, as COVID's been dying down, but I, I've been staying home and I know that this is God punishing me. I know God is angry at me and I promise you, I promise you if God heals, I'm, I'm back in church and I'm never gonna miss. And, and, I, and I just had to stop her. I just said, you, you can't think that way. I said, now, is God punishing you because you haven't shown? That's not the way God works. I said, now let me be clear. Don't stop giving. That's important. God, you know, I didn't say that. I said, I, said, I said, let me be clear. That is not the way God works. That's the religious God. That's the God of, well, if you don't do this, then I won't do this. On the night that Jesus was born, an angel announced his birth to a group of shepherds with these words. We read it earlier. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but everything about the message of Jesus is good news. Every teaching, every act, 
Every bit of mercy, every bit of compassion, it's good news, it's good news, it's good news. So if you say, well, the reason I'm not a follower of Jesus, the reason I don't show up to in-person service, the reason I don't engage online typically is I don't like the message of Jesus. I don't, I'm telling you, you're missing. Someone screwed it up for you because everything about this is good news. But it is possible for something to be good news and not bring me great joy. If you stop me in the lobby or you call me or sent me an email and say, hey, just want you to know, Dave, I got a huge promotion. God's blessing, that's good news for you. Don't bring me great joy. Hey, oh, Dave, I invested in uh, this crypto early on. And now cryptos, I, I invested in Bitcoin back in 2012, man. And now you know, that's good news for you. It doesn't bring me great joy. It only brings me great joy when it becomes personal. A savior being born into this world to save us and rescue us from the power of sin from the shame and the stigma of sin, that is good news, but it only brings us great joy when it becomes personal. So I'm just gonna ask you, has it become personal for you? Have you ever opened your heart to the grace of God? Have you ever opened your heart to the forgiveness? So you hear talk, this is good news, but it's not brought me great joy. Have you ever done that? And if not, my encouragement to you this season is to open your heart and to say, God, I receive and I embrace your grace. I am no longer gonna be the queen. I'm no longer gonna be the king of my life. I'm stepping off the throne and I'm inviting you onto the throne of my life, King Jesus. You get to have say. You get to determine what happens. I follow you over me. If you've never done that, just in the quietness of your own heart to say, I embrace it. I receive this. This is what I do today. I make that decision. And, and here at you know, in-person service, we, we can fill out a connection card. We can show, uh, walk to the front afterwards. There'll be people to pray with you and you can kind of link your faith with theirs. You can uh, show up to the next steps table in the lobby and make someone aware of that decision because we want to pray for you and encourage you and resource you. Here's the deal. The, the story of Christmas is that God loves us, but all the love in the universe doesn't do us a bit of good if our hearts are close to him. A relationship takes two. Two people have to say yes to God. And God says yes through the birth, through the life, and through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the question is, will you say yes? Will you trust God and surrender your life to him? Now, I also know that plenty of us, including myself, we made the decision to follow Jesus and we, sh- we hear talks like this and like, ah, I don't know that it really brings me great joy. Well, when's the last time that you cooperated with God and where you just said, hey God, I'm bringing you with little faith I have, with a little obedience I have, a little humility I have, and I, I want to try to cooperate with you. Because whenever we cooperate with God, this good news moves to bring in great joy. So maybe you look over your life and you say, you know what, in the last six months, I can't show any area that it's brought me great joy. Well, maybe this season is a time that we just start taking our next right step, whatever that looks like. Right? Maybe, maybe we say, I'm going to start loosening up the grip I have on stuff and I'm going to become more and more generous. I'm just going to try to go on this journey. And as we do, the good news becomes great joy. Or maybe someone's hurt us so deeply and we've just refused to go on a forgiveness journey. But this season, we're going to say, okay, as difficult as it is, as it is for me, I'm going to go on this journey. And I'm telling you, I promise you, this message of good news starts to bring great joy because it works. When's the last time it's brought you great joy? As you grow in compassion, as you grow in understanding, moves from good news to great joy. It brings comfort. That's what God wants for us. His, His desire for us isn't to be some deity up in the sky somewhere looking down on us. His desire is to be God with us. And when we experience that in a personal way, it's a message that goes from being good news to bringing great joy. And I just end with this. I do know that sometimes it feels like we have very little to offer, right? It's just like, eh, I don't have much. I, I want to follow you. I want to take my next right step, but I just have a little bit of faith and a little bit of humility and a, a little bit of willingness. I don't have a lot. God takes it. You know, that's the story of the little drummer boy that often gets uh, sung about at Christmas. You got this little drummer boy who's invited by the Magi to give gifts to Jesus, to this newborn king. And they've given gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so they said to this little kid, hey, you give whatever gift you have. And the little kid just feels insignificant. He says, I have no gift to bring that's fit to give our king. All he has is a drum. And so he says, I played my drum for him, pa rum pum pum 
And I feel like that a lot, like, God, I don't have much to give you today. My faith's been rocked. My willingness is just at an all-time low. Right? My willpower just feels like it's fading. Once again today, I give you what I can. I played my drum for him, pa pum pum It's all I have today. And God takes what little faith we have, what little willingness we have, what little humility, and he works with it. And over time, the good news becomes great joy as we experience in our life. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for my friends at Timberlake Church. And I pray that this season would be a season where the good news of the birth of Jesus becomes great joy for all of us. We thank you that 2,000 years ago, a virgin named Mary discovered she had become pregnant through a supernatural work of God and that the life and teachings of Jesus revolutionized our planet in a way that no religion can ever compare to. We receive the gift of your grace and your compassion and your mercy and your love in our life today. This season, help us to spread it everywhere we go that we do experience true comfort and true joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And can we thank Dave for sharing with us today? Well, as we conclude our service in, in just a moment, there's gonna be a few people here at the front of the stage. Uh, if you would like prayer for anything, if you prayed that prayer with Dave for the first time or the first time in a long time, we would love to have a conversation with you. They're gonna be stationed here at the front. If you're joining us online, there's people in the chat room for that as well. Otherwise, let me invite you to stand. Again, thanks so much for being here. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you back next weekend. Thank you for joining us today and I hope you enjoyed the message. Before you go, don't forget to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week. And Christmas Eve is approaching fast and in case you don't have a local church to attend, you can join us live right here on December 24th at 11, 1, 3, 5, and 7. Again, thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you next week and Christmas Eve at online.timberlakechurch.com.